Today I'm going through my reports with Elwin, Elwin Robinson, uh, genetic insight reports. Obviously I sent off my 23andMe info to Elwin and he's used that to yeah bring these results to the fore and now he's going to discuss them with me. So hopefully it's as interesting for you as it is for me. So yeah, away we go. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you for being willing to share your <laughs> reports with the world. I really appreciate it. Um, you're actually the first uh, influencer or whatever you want to call yourself <laughs> that's been happy to do this. So I appreciate it. Um, so this is uh, what it looks like when you're in site. You get a, a very large amount of reports. I've uh, you got a demo access here to the limitless package. So you get literally several hundred different reports. Um, and so it's up to you what we could focus on. Uh, one of the things that people do is just focus on the reports where they have a higher risk score. That's where you get the red here. And so that tells you things that you have a higher risk of having happen to you. Now, a couple of caveats. Obviously, this is not um, fortune telling. It can't be sure what's going to happen to you. But um, I found that the higher risk score is uh, pretty accurate, that most people, by the time they're in their 30s, 40s, they've had most of the things happen to them at some point or it's an ongoing issue. Um, the one exception to that is actually people like yourself, Mike, people who are very focused on health and have been for a long time. A lot of the time it's less accurate for them, but then they might go, oh, you know what? You know, this isn't something that I've had an issue with, but maybe my brothers and sisters, my parents do, like most people in my family do. So you can still see the genetic connection there. Um, so yeah, so we can look at the high risk things. Another thing we can do that's sometimes interesting is look at nutrition. So look at what nutrients that you need more of. Um, another thing that we can look at, I know that you're interested in, you know, sports stuff. So strength and fitness will tell you uh, what your innate capabilities and whatnot are in that regard. Um, we can look at toxins, um, we can look at, you know, what lab markers you tend to have. Uh, there's lots of different categories we can look at, or we can just look at the high risk ones and start from there. What, is there anything? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, well, first of all, just let people know that I've just turned 48. So this is being recorded in 2023. Um, so I'm 48 now, just if anyone wondered, but yeah, let's start with the highest risk and then, okay. um, and then just sort of flow from there. Okay. So um, let's see, more likely to have strep infection, but that's not super common. Is that something that you've uh, suffered with? No, no. no. Rotator cuff injury? Yeah, see likely. that is, yeah, that's a definite. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can start off by um, like, you know, just from seeing what I can see on the screen there, like the glucose section. Um, yeah. The first one, my mum had diabetes, my sister's got diabetes, my brother's got diabetes. I don't have diabetes. Um, however, yeah, I know that there's, I would say sugar metabolism, family history. Um, it's probably not, you know, it's probably not the best um, or easily expressed maybe would be, you know, in from bad habits. So if you ate like a normal person for the last 48 years, you might have high fasting glucose by now. <laughs> Possibly, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So let's dig into that one then. Yeah, go on. So this is what a report looks like. You get a little introduction at the beginning. Uh, you get a little explanation about how it actually works. So just you know, very briefly, all of these uh, reports are based on SNPs. So SNPs are single little variations in your genetic code. So your genetic code is like long strings of four different letters, A, C, T, H. And, you know, it might be A, A, T, T, C, A, A, something like that. And the, there's a variation where you might have a a c t instead of t t so that one little letter variation creates these risks so that's what the whole thing is based on and it also creates everything so the you know the color of your eyes the color of your hair whether you're tall you know all these kind of things as much as it's impacted by genetics is impacted by these snips um these snips stay the same throughout your entire life so this is not something that you can change. This is just a tendency and then you can either express the issue or not, as we just said. So yeah, uh, this one actually gives you a percentile score. Can you see that, Mike? Yep. And so you can see actually, not only are you more likely to have this than you know the average person, but you're actually in the top 6% of people who are likely to have this issue. Um, and so that is a case, you know, you said this is something you suffered with? 
Oh, this is something that's just a constant ongoing. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I can't really perform certain exercises um, or why I wouldn't focus on, say, for example, doing like a bench press or a press up or those kinds of exercises because, um, yeah, it's easy for, easy for, well, in the past, yeah, that, that just wrecks my rotator cuff. So I steer away from those, those types of movements. Um, I play a lot of golf and there's been times in the past where I've had some, yeah, some shoulder tightness that's needs some work done. So I'm, I'm really, I'm highly conscious of the fact that, I mean, without seeing this, that my rotator cuffs and the way my shoulders sit and everything else is not, you know, it's, if, if I was to wave a magic wand, it would be an area that I would have resolved. But I'm, what's interesting as well is that I have winged scapula and some people will go, oh, yeah, it's because you did this, 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 this when you were younger. But, you know, I've got four children. And if you look at all four children, every single one of them has got winged scapula, even from like literally, the you know, the moment they, they were born. So I'm because I'm always looking at them and observing them and thinking, you know, isn't it interesting that we have this similar tendency? So, um, yeah, so that's really interesting. Interesting. It comes up right at the beginning. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not always good news when you see a report like this because it tells you as you just said there is a genetic basis to it so to a certain degree there's not a lot you can do about having that vulnerability of course you can not have issues with it but you know there's not much you can do about having that vulnerability if you want to know it tells you all the you know main genetics variants those snips i was just talking about which is uh contributing most people are not interested in that but in case you want to know the science behind it and then um you know, it gives recommendations this recommendation section uh is due to be expanded soon the key thing to know about the recommendations is that they are different for every person so um this is personalized to your genetics so i guess this is a fairly obvious one that you got here at number one reducing the strain on your shoulder right like you were just talking about um and you see here it's got impact and evidence so that's basically like a score that tells you how important that recommendation is for you um, and it's saying, obviously, that one is crucially important. So often the first couple of recommendations for someone like yourself will be things that you already know, probably already doing, physical therapy, another one that you're probably doing, you know, some type or another. Um, avoiding smoking is an interesting one. I don't think you've ever smoked. Um, I believe, yeah, this would be because of the uh, effect that smoking has on delivery of oxygen. Uh, not being overweight is probably another typical recommendation and yeah that's pretty much it often for injuries there's not a huge amount of recommendations if we looked at the high blood sugar one you know maybe there would be a lot more recommendations um so uh you happy to move on to another one yeah yeah go for it go for it so i'd say i'll just scroll and you tell me what you're interested in yeah see i look at, it's interesting i look at um i look at addictions mm -hmm. and i feel like i mean i suppose each one of them has got a little you know, I've got my own little story that I can talk about with regards to that. Like I, I was making the comment to someone the other day that I just, I just read the Matthew Perry, um, or listened to his audio book, um, the guy from friends who recently passed away and the whole book was really about his addiction. And I often feel like I've always suffered with an addiction, but with like to biscuits or <laughs> something along those kinds of lines, which, you know, as a, I suppose as a health educator, I would always say it's fairly under control in to a degree, um, whereby there'll be phases where I won't eat any, what I would consider any junk food at all for months on end. And then there'll be a time when, um, like I always used to give Christmas as the example, like you so, well, I'm so surrounded by it that I'll, I'll delve in a little bit and then all of a sudden, and I'm fighting addiction through January again, just to sort of come to come off of it again. So even though it's not, you know, it's not cocaine or crack or anything like that, um, or heroin and whatnot, it's still, I still feel like. I have to be, um, yeah, I'm just mindful of it and sugar, I suppose it's, you know, you know, what can I say? It's just, um, it's a, I have to be mindful of a, of a sugar addiction, which is usually at the end of the day, last thing at night type of, not like, you know, kind of, um, yeah, I suppose between the hours of like seven and nine. Um, and, uh, it's probably the last, it's the final thing that I battle with on a regular basis. Um, I can go the whole day without eating any junk whatsoever. In fact, I've got a pretty, clearly defined plan but when it comes to that particular time at night yeah I've, I've definitely got a um well I think I've been I've been lucky that I've found enough good things to do which keep me feeling good and I've got a, a very clear vision of what I want to do those things help me you know engage in my vision 
Um, however, I know that if I, I think if I didn't have that, if I didn't have a, a reason for living, that's kind of a strange way of putting it, but like a, sort of a bit of a black and white saying, but if I didn't have a, a passion and a reason for doing things, I could easily see myself just, you know, kind of going down a route of um, doing bad things, probably like the majority of what a lot of people do. But I, I see it as an addiction because I, there's no need for it in my in my diet. Um, so, yeah, I, I relate to this to an addictive personality. So um, we do have specific reports about, say, alcohol addiction, and it's not saying that. But, yeah, it's more that you have a tendency to – uh, get addicted to whatever it is that you're into. Yeah, I guess. And in fact, on that note as well, <laughs> like I started learning a piano about a year and a half ago, and I'm very much addicted to doing that every day. Like no, mm. no matter what, I'll do that. And golf, like I mean, that is, if I can't play golf, then it's like there's a level of misery that starts to enter my life. Whereas if I can play, I get the high. So yeah, I'm, there are certain things that I'm definitely yeah. I, I would say. It's a, for me, it's a, it's a somewhat positive thing. It's just making sure those addictions, addictions are relatively, um, you know, uh, useful to my existence, I suppose. Yes. And another thing I noticed is uh, with dopamine. Um, oh, where is that? So there was a dopamine report as well. And uh, with that one, it said you have a tendency to low dopamine. And I oh, okay. actually do believe that is the root cause of uh, most addictions is that when you have low dopamine, uh, you tend to do things that stimulate dopamine a lot because you're trying to raise that dopamine back to like a normal level. Um, and, you know, every time you achieve something, that's a big dopamine hit. So, you know, whether that's uh, hitting a golf ball the right way or whatever, that, that gives you a nice yeah. <laughs> dopamine hit. Um, okay, so that's really interesting. Um, Anything else that oh, do you want to see the recommendations for that? Or I think you you got that under control already. Yeah, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm pretty um, indigestion. I think yeah, I've me. I mean, I've been eating good foods for plenty of health, plenty of time. High risk bone health. That's interesting, but not uh, physical activity wise. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, stress. I would say yeah, I'd probably lean more towards. I'm certainly you know I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say I'm laid back at all. You know? <laughs> yeah, stress is an interesting one because, you know, I've been saying for a long time that stress is the root cause of a lot of uh, health challenges if it's not managed, right, potentially. Um, and I have this tendency for high stress as well. So, yeah, you know, yours is top 11%. So uh, what I take from that is you have a tendency to, you know, run higher on the stress chemicals, which is epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. Uh, you're at the top 11% here. So, you know, that's fairly high. So, and for example, you know, one of the things that I do from time to time is is the heart math. And I feel brilliant when I've done that. I feel brilliant when I've done meditation, all those kinds of things. But I don't, I don't, I'm not immediately draw like that should be the top of my priority list. I should be doing those before anything else in a day. And yet they always get left to last or not at all. So it's it's interesting how I, you know, kind of avoid the thing that probably makes me feel the best um, and just crack on with plowing through a day, getting stuff done, going from one thing to the next and, you know, getting to the end of the day and feeling like I've achieved something as opposed to maybe taking the foot off the gas a bit and um, concentrating more on meditation and the heart math technology. So, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm I'm aware of that. I suppose I would relate that to the previous conversation about dopamine. Um, so generally, there's two things that you know make give you energy. It's either adrenaline or dopamine. And so if your dopamine is naturally low, you're going to tend to either want to boost it with achievements, as you just said, dopamine boosting activities. That's the healthiest version of it. Or it's going to be stress. You know, oh god, I got to do this by a certain time. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. Um, and the relaxing, even though it sounds like a good thing in theory, it's a more low energy state, and that can be less appealing uh, when your dopamine is low. So maybe that's a factor. Mm, interesting. Um, so some of the recommendations are uh, therapy, always a good one. Um, relaxation techniques, <laughs> like you just said, yoga, meditation, heart math would certainly be in there, mindfulness. Um, and yeah, massage. I think you do that. Right? Yeah, pretty regular with that kind of thing. But again, that's more physical based. 
I hate CBD. Uh, Don't get me on that stuff. That knocks me right out and makes me just, you know. But ashwagandha, that's an interesting one because I do have that from time to time. Um, it sits in my cupboard and, yeah. Well, ashwagandha is one that's proven to lower cortisol specifically. So that might be a good one right at the end of the day in a regular basis. Yeah, um, yeah. For stress. Uh, Make a note of that, actually, because that, that could do with going in my sort of evening routine before bed. Yeah, I'd recommend that. Spending time in nature is good. Yeah, there's your, there's your golf right there. Yes, exactly. I was just thinking. Yeah, see, I can't, I can't really, I can't go a day with sitting in front of the computer all day after, you know, getting early, get work done, get out on the course. Now, in terms of stress, you, you also have another very interesting genetic variant called COMPT. So COMPT is the rate at which you break down stress chemicals. So some people break down stress chemicals quickly. Some people break them down slowly. And I, I call that, like, it, it often changes the archetype of what someone is. They say warrior or warrior, but I think it's more wizard or warrior. Because if you break down stress chemicals very quickly, you're quite suited to be in a high stress environment. So bullets, bullets flying around, people screaming and shouting around you and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, That's actually quite invigorating to um, a fast comps person. To a slow comps person, it's a nightmare. And they like to be in quite a peaceful environment where they can focus. Yeah. The, the, the advantage of being a slow comp person is that they can actually focus quite well. They can focus better than the average person. Yeah. So a fast, fast comp person, they kind of need the drama and strife and crisis around them to feel alive. Whereas a slow comp person is actually able to sit in a room on their own all day, for instance, and get a lot done <laughs> yeah. without needing a lot of drama. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, you know, from what I know of you, that's very um, accurate for you, right? You're able to really focus despite you know, not having a lot of people around you pushing you to do so, you're... you're oh, yeah, I don't, don't need, yeah, I don't need any external motivation for sure. But so what is this saying? This saying Is this saying that I clear stress chemicals well? No, it's the opposite. You break them out slowly. Oh, so uh, right. Basically, if you're in um, a stressful environment, as I said, like, say you're in a job, like I used to work in a kitchen where people are screaming and shouting at each other all the time, that wouldn't suit you because you like it would take you a very long time to calm down from that because the stress chemicals keep building yeah. whereas for you as i said in a room on your own without probably any background noise is more yeah. of an ideal environment because then you don't have those stress chemicals build up so you can keep them you know at a man manageable level no for sure that's what stressed me out i think but from having kids like I used to work from home mm. uh, yeah working from home and then having kids running around <sighs> No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm also similar to this. I remember first time I was uh, working with one of my business partners um, and I was on the phone with him and he had this screaming and shouting in the background from kids. And I was like, I can't focus in this conversation. I'm actually amazed that you can, <laughs> you know, in this room with them. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I can very much relate to that as well. Um, and so that's a really good one to know because it's really good to understand yourself like you, I, I know you already do, but I'm just saying in general that, you know, you do well in one environment, other people do well in a different environment and you can just, you know, respect each other and there's nothing wrong with me, there's nothing wrong with you. One of the big things for me with this, Mike, was to realize even though I'm this, um, it's not all bad because the benefit of it is the fact that you're self initiate, like self-motivating and that you can um, really get things done without, you know, a lot of drama around you. And as I say, for me to realize that that environment I used to be in the kitchen of screaming and shouting all the time was terrible. <laughs> uh, that was really wearing me down. The other thing that's interesting about this, Mike, is that um, plant chemicals tend to slow down Compt even more, whereas things in animal food tend to speed it up. And so specifically methylation supporters like creatine, choline, B12, which are found more in animal foods, tend to speed up Compt. And then flavonoids like, you know, quercetin and resveratrol and all those kind of things tend to slow it down. Meaning if you're very, if you're slow comped already, if you eat like a vegan diet with a lot of, um, you know, brightly colored food, you're going to be slowing it down even more. Um, and so I, I know that you eat some animal food, right? Um, and so that's supported from this perspective. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of my supplementation at the moment actually is, is, is probably steered more towards yeah, animals as well, which is interesting. I've kind of slowly over time gravitated to more organ-based, you know, supplementation, um, which is interesting. So 
yeah, especially that's good for choline, which, uh, you know, liver has got a high amount of choline, which is one of the best things for methylation. Um, now, any v pure vegan watching this, of course, you can supplement, right? You can supplement choline, you can supplement creatine, you can supplement the B vitamins. You don't have to eat animal food. Um, but it's just, it's good to know that you need to do that. And I think I made myself quite messed up by not knowing this about myself and then only eating plant foods and just making it worse and worse. So um, it's good to know that. So anyway, it talks about relaxation again, and we'd have to go through that. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of stress, that's really uh, good to know about yourself, just what kind of environment suits you best. Um, anyway, this one jumped out at me, actually, Mike, lead. Um, it's something that is one of the biggest breakthroughs in my health for the last few years is seeing this report and then doing a test and seeing that I actually had really high levels of lead in my blood. Of course, I don't know that that is you, but I would actually say when I see this report, I would say it's worth testing just to see okay. if it's something that may be affecting you. Um, you know, after the call, I'm happy to give a recommendation about where you can get that tested. Because um, lead is one of the very worst toxins. It's not maybe as troublesome as, say, mercury, but the main problem with it is that once you have it in your system, your body stores a lot of it in your bones, and then it stays there for literally decades, just slowly poisoning you. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. So that's something that's really good to know about. Um. An increased need for calcium is also interesting. Um, do you eat dairy? Yeah, a little bit of yogurt. But interestingly, recently I've been, again, going back to the whole um, nose-to-tail animal nutrition aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some uh, bone and marrow supplements and living bone, which I've started to use. But yeah, yogurt. Mm -hmm. And um, I, had a, I saw a practitioner recently who was doing some tests and said that I'd be better off with sheep yogurt, interestingly enough. Um, so, um, yeah, I started experimenting with that, trying, trying that out, but yeah, that's interesting to know. Excellent. And this is especially important if you have high leads, which you probably don't, but just in case you do, because the lower calcium your diet is, the more that you absorb lead and the more likely you are to have your lead put in the bones. Cause basically the body mistakes lead for calcium. Right. If you have that increased need for calcium, this is one of the things that no one talks about, but that I do again see quite low in people. Again, just without a dairy diet, it's fine to not have a, because dairy is so high in calcium compared to pretty much all other foods. Um, it's fine to not have dairy if you don't have an increased need for calcium, you can get enough from other foods. But if you have an increased need, it is actually very hard without dairy or supplementation. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, anything else jump out at you so far or just carry on scrolling? Yeah, well, I've got dandruff's interesting because that's something that comes and goes. Um, Let's see if there's any helpful recommendations then if it's something you're still dealing with. We'll just take a second to load. Never suffer with gout. Um, good. Yeah, that's quite unusual with someone with a good diet. Omega-6 to 3 would be interesting because I've always leaned towards having a... Um, yeah, having sort of a pharmaceutical grade fish oil supplement and mm -hmm. more recently started using some of the um, Andrea seed oils um, just because of the, you know, I was quite intrigued by the, the whole technology and they do taste amazing, the purity of them, um, but I still have a pharmaceutical grade fish oil and so I'd be interested, yeah, I'd be interested to see that. Because I always felt good off of it's interesting. I always felt good off when I ate, when I ate fish. Just many years ago, before I went vegan, before I then came back to a more kind of you know um, balanced between veg vegetation and animal protein. Um, you know, it's you need to have enough omega three in ratio to omega six, otherwise it tends to have an inflammatory effect yeah. on the whole body, right? And so. This is just more true for you than some people. Um, for whatever reason, your body retains more omega-6 and less omega-3 through, you know, genetic variant. I mean, I say for whatever reason, but there are the variants. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to look it up. So, yeah, I would say, I personally, if this was my genetics, I would emphasize plenty of omega-3s and I would actually try and avoid omega-6s. Not in any kind of... Um, you know, uh, rigid, uptight way, but I wouldn't say supplement with extra omega sixes. Yeah, um, sure, sure. Like hemp seed oil or stuff like that. If I had this tendency, um, so yeah, I'd say that is very good to know. And then the recommendations are pretty obvious: just increase the omega three, yeah, and reduce the omega six. There's not a lot to it, other than that. 
Um, so yeah, I personally wouldn't supplement with them. Um, what were we looking at before? Sorry. Oh, he was going to look at the um, the dandruff. Oh, dandruff. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's see what recommendations we have for that one. So yeah, top fourteen percent most likely to have that. So it's interesting, right? Because you wouldn't expect it with someone as healthy as yourself. But you know, one of the things that you know this really teaches you is that everyone has weakest links genetically, and so the problems just tend to sh it, unless you're literally in perfect health you'll have some problems and where those problems show up they'll they'll show up where you have a high risk so um, what's interesting it says there is um not shampooing enough because i very rarely shampoo you see i wait until my hair just gets a bit you know grubby because it's always short i've always got a hat on um i don't really really care less about what my hair looks like to a degree but mm -hmm. um, but I use the Living Libations um, C Buckthorn shampoo, and when I do, it all is good. But you know, I just kind of just it's just a habit that I just don't tend to, um, um, yeah, I just don't tend to shampoo that often, which is interesting. That's the first thing I spotted. So it's something to consider. Let's see if it's uh, high up in your recommendations. So relaxation technique is actually high. Yeah, see that's interesting because maybe yeah, if the. Um, it's funny it says their depression because I had somebody else, um, something else, some other practitioner said that, that I, you know, at my worst, I lead towards depression. And I would say that, yeah, if I didn't do the things that I do, which I've kind of learned over years to feel myself, well, allow myself to feel as good as I can, as much as I can, I can see from other family members that depression could be a, you know, it could be a route that I went down. I couldn't imagine it now based on, the, the, you know, the things that I do. But, I, you know, I could still, I can still remember times when, um, yeah, things weren't great. And, yeah, anxiety, depression, definitely um, it's interesting to see that there. I'd say that definitely goes hand-in-hand hand with low dopamine. Uh, so dopamine is like your motivation and your drive. and all Yeah, that. yeah. Yeah. Um, so how it helps with diet and drive, it can, so stress can trigger it is what it's saying. Yeah, yeah, interesting um and then you're more sensitive to stress so just yeah maybe see if there's correlation the other thing it's recommending is um topical sulfur i don't know if that's something you tried i haven't actually heard of that using shampoos of two percent sulfur alone or two percent salicylic acid i've heard of that that's aspirin um as a skin condition i i at least can direct you to someone who does a skin product with salicylic acid and you can try it if you like yeah why not why not but it sounds like from what you're saying, it's possible that if you just shampoo regularly, it might also go away. Yeah, it's um, not because that's the thing. It doesn't tend to, um, it seems to be, uh, yeah, funnily enough, it probably, it's the same with my beard. If I let my beard grow for ages, you know, then it all starts to get a bit, yeah, a bit crusty and whatnot around there. Um, how fruits help with dandruff? Fruits are, okay, impact one out of five years. See, I'm not really a big fan of fruits. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got to like, because there aren't a huge amount of strong, a lot of, you know, high evidence recommendations here. That's not, um, but it's, so, you know, it's saying there is a uh, association between a high fruit diet and less of uh, dundra, 30% less. So that's based on a study. Uh, and then topical salicylic acid. Yeah, that's what I was recommending. That's a, an aspirin uh, thing. So, yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think what's most interesting is picking out things that I look at and go, okay, yeah, well, that, you know, that relates to things that I'm aware of. Yes. Appendicitis, actually. Yeah, my dad had appendicitis. Mm. Um, I haven't. And uh, that's good. It would be interesting to see what the, um, if there's anything I can keep on top of. Uh, I don't think there's really recommendations for this one, unfortunately. Yeah, no. But, you know, it's basically the health of the uh, intestines. Yeah, right? yeah. So especially the microbiome in the intestines and stuff like that. And then, of course, you know, just being healthy in general, so your immune system's good, all that kind of stuff. So this is an interesting one because I know it's not true. Uh, physical activity, I know you love to be physically active. Um, so it's saying, though, that genetically you have a, less of a tendency to be physically active. Um, is that true for your Oh, no, yeah, it's true for my... Well, it's interesting because my mum, she was not active at all. I don't think my brother's very active. He was when he was younger because he did a lot of skating, a lot of ice skating and ice hockey. My sister wasn't, but my dad is, you know, he ran a marathon and that kind of thing. So 
yeah, yeah. that's kind of and I've always played sports and and whatnot. So, um, so in that case, we could either say it's just inaccurate, um, or we could say you know that nature is trump nurture. Um, that you know maybe you inherited that gene from your mother, but watching your father and seeing how that was good for him made you do it anyway. You know. Yeah, I think from my perspective, like I feel good when I've when I've done exercise. I feel good when I've, you know, any any kind of in comparison to the the alternative, which is sitting around. Yeah, I feel much better. You know, unless I'm in the sun on the beach, lying down, relaxing. But then I'd want to go and swim every now and again. So, <laughs> so it's funny you brought up your um, heart math because you have a heart rate variability tendency, and it is saying that it tends to be low. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. And it says up to 60% of differences are due to genetics. So that's a lot, right? Given that what they would probably teach is that it's mainly lifestyle, right? It's, you know, you're, you're running around stressed and stuff like that. But actually it's saying, no, um, the, biggest vari- the biggest difference actually is genetics. Um, that's what they've observed. That might explain why I feel so good when I've done it. I mean, I feel incredibly good when I've done it, you know. Yes. It's almost to the point where, like now talking about it, I'm so disassociated from how good I know it felt. I don't, I'm not like rushing home to put the clip on my ear and hook it up and, and get back into that amazing state, which is kind of weird. But that's another, you know. I'll tell you, my, sometimes it's technology. I'll tell you, my experience is literally if you slow your breathing down to five or six breaths a minute, yeah, you'll go into high heart rate variability. Yeah, you okay. Need anything else. So um, I don't know if you know, but a lot of prayers like are traditionally patterned so that the amount that you talk and then you breathe in you would naturally go to five or six breaths a minute same with chanting and stuff like that so it's something to try you can do it in the car driving home or whatever you don't actually have to be hipped up to the machine yeah uh, yeah i would say so yeah something to consider and then you know you already know what to do about that it says you know exercise does help with it of course which you really do a lot of biofeedback i know you're a fan of that which you know is what heart math actually is right yeah yeah So, yeah, this is probably all obvious to you. So, time for a little bit more. So, yeah, um, let's look at nutritional needs. Yeah, sure, sure. To people. So, there's a few nutrients that you need more of. We talked about one already, which is calcium, which is actually your top one. Uh, some people in the health industry are actually down on calcium. Like they say it's a bad thing and you you don't want to calcify your tissues, which is obviously true. Um, but obviously if you have enough K- vitamin K2 as well, then I don't see any issue with having calcium, especially if you need it, if, if you just have a genetic tendency to need more of it. Um, the thionine is an amino acid. Um, I've seen research that says high levels of methionine are also not good. So the fact that you naturally tend to have lower levels of it is not necessarily a bad thing, but <laughs> if you wanted to increase it, then, um, it tends to be in sulfurous, uh, proteins. So again, more animal proteins. Yeah. Uh, beta alanine is a building block for carnosine. Uh, I'm sure you know carnosine, right? It's the, um, antioxidant amino acid that is found again, more in animal foods. So it's something you could consider supplementing with. I know it's a lot used a lot in the kind of uh, sports and fitness community anyway to give you a bit of a boost. Um, it's funny, we talked about omega-6 earlier. So I was recommending to lower omega-6. So I definitely say that's true of seed oils, but one exception might be GLA, uh, gamma linoleic acid, um, which is actually probably the only anti-inflammatory form of omega-6. So, and it's saying you have an increased need for it. So pe- when people have that, it means they're not very good at doing the conversion from linolenic acid to gamma linolenic acid. Um, and uh, so that's something. So none of these though, so far, I would worry too much about though, to be honest, except for calcium. Taurine is an interesting one. Um, taurine is essential to pets, right? Like cats and dogs, they make sure they add it to their food. It's considered non-essential in humans because you can make your own. But taurine is super important for detoxification. Uh, it's also super important as a building block for GABA, which is your main calming neurotransmitter. Yeah, interesting. Uh, taurine also has a lot of longevity and anti-aging research around it, saying it's beneficial. So out of all the things here, it's probably the number one thing I'd recommend trying that is non-essential. Yeah, sure, sure. I would go for you know anything from 500 milligrams to 2,000 milligrams of taurine. Some people say that they feel amazing on it. Um, I've seen a lot of the people in the biohacking community say, you know, it really does give you wings, as the ad says. So, def- you know, at least uh, I'd say give it a try. But again, unless you're eating, uh, this taurine tends to be higher in animal foods again. So 
you know, I know you eat those, so you, you're unlikely to be very low on it, but you could see if you feel better with more. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, copper is another one. So I think this is especially important for people, uh, people who supplement with zinc. I don't know if that's something that you do. Yeah, yeah. Do you supplement with copper as well? No. No. So, you know, copper is an essential mineral as well, and it's antagonistic to zinc, meaning the more zinc you have, the more you deplete your copper. Yeah. And, and vice versa. So a lot of people are taking 20, 30, 50 milligrams of zinc a day, no copper. You want to be taking copper uh, like at least a ratio of 20 to 1 with zinc, meaning if you are having 20 milligrams of zinc, you want to have one milligram of copper. Yeah, because some, um, some supplements, they come combined, but yeah, the, the, the yeah. one I'm using at the moment doesn't. So it's interesting to know, yeah, for sure. So copper, very important for the hormones, very important to prevent anemia very important for the immune system um you know all kinds of things that uh copper is uh, super super important for i i found when i do actual blood tests of people and i see a correlation between low copper and weak immunity so that's the number one thing i see uh, skin health is another thing another way you can get copper is the uh, copper peptides uh, i don't know if you come across that the the blue um uh skin stuff have you come across that? I can send you one of those. Um, no, no, no. So copper peptide is another one. Okay. GHK copper, that's kind of trendy these days because it's supposed to, um, you know, have a strong anti-aging effect on your skin. Right. A lot of people use it in their face, including my wife. Um, and then, yeah, increased need for tryptophan. You're probably fine with that. You eat protein despite it being increased need. And then increased need for vitamin C. Yeah, which is interesting because I kind of, yeah, I'm... I'm just all over that supplement. <laughs> so, yeah, interesting. Excellent. Uh, good news is that, you know, a lot of things that people are commonly low in, uh, like magnesium, you don't have an increased need for. So that's good. Uh, what we also have in here is carbohydrate, protein, and fat. So a lot of people, so there's protein, for instance, a lot of people have a lot of worry and stress about, should I be having more carbs? Should I be having less carbs? Should I be having more fat? Should I be having less fat? And a lot of the time, it really does depend on your DNA. So what I'm seeing here is you're actually good with all of them. You don't have a particular issue of needing more or less of, of uh, any of the carb sources, sorry, of the calorie sources or the fuel sources. Um, so that's good news. In fact, it's showing here that you have a good response to fat and carbohydrates. So, you know, in specific instances, you might be, feel better restricting carbohydrates, like if you have SIBO, for instance, or something like that. But it's saying in general, metabolically, your body's perfectly able to turn carbs or fat and turn them into fuel. Yeah, it's funny. Another recent thing with a practitioner said that, you know, for me, rice was a real a real key thing. And 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 I do have a lot of rice, eat a lot of rice cakes and, um, you know, and fat wise. Yeah, fat, ghee, coconut oil. Although he was saying, yeah, you want to steer away from the animal side of things. He also said that my ideal kind of location for living would be um sri lanka which was interesting just based on the fact that my body doesn't tend to do well with cold um mm. thought that was interesting and uh, avocados fat you know um but yeah well, so yeah so it's all i think that's the thing is the more you learn about yourself through whether it's these kinds of things practitioners you know you can build a you can build a picture like for me a lot of this is sort of you know confirmation of oh well, that's interesting because you know i lean towards that i lean towards that but then there's also these other things which um you know the copper and the taurine and the lead can highlight things that i haven't you know got any awareness of um yes. so yeah in terms of the animal fat that may just be that he says that to everyone um because some people really do struggle with saturated fat it's not good for them yeah uh but you're not that person yeah you're okay yeah and again, not saying you should have it, obviously. And if you wanted to be vegan, you could have coconut, you know, sauce for saturated fat. That's fine. But yeah, according to this, at least you're absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to look at sports and strength and fitness? Yeah. 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 That. Um, anything else jumps out at me there while I'm waiting for that to load? Oh, alcohol sensitivity. So not a tendency to alcohol addiction, which I know you don't have. Um, but it's saying it's not particularly good for you to have alcohol. Is that true from your experience well i would say that I, I definitely react to it you know if you want to see my personality change you give me a few pints of beer and i'll be off the charts <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's not something i really do anymore i'd say you know early 30s that 
sort of dive death um and even a glass of wine now that I pretty much do if I if I was to have one but I don't even really I've got no real interest in it if I'm honest it's not really you know I'd be more if you know I'd be more like someone said right there's some alcohol over there or some you know some chocolates or some biscuits I'd be like give me the biscuits give me the chocolate you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I totally get that, me too. So, yeah, it turns out I wanted to check what this was based on. It's the aldehyde gene that breaks down, um, you know, when you drink alcohol, your body turns it initially into something more toxic called aldehyde. And it's saying that your body then struggles to break that down. Um, some people who have that, uh, I think it's much more common variant with Asian people and you get like a red face from it. You get a little bit of a histamine reaction. If you drink right. too much. Okay. Um, so it may not have been your experience again because you've been healthy for a long time, but... There's that tendency, that possibility. Oh, yeah. What were we doing? We were doing, um, yeah. So physical activity. So we talked about the rotator cuff already. Physical activity, you said that's not accurate. Um, heart rate variability, we said that probably is. Um, heart rate recovery is interesting. So it's saying that um, with intense exercise, it takes your heart rate longer to recover. I have no idea if that's true. Is that true? Um, not really. Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to think now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you look at the factors of my personality, like, you know, I'm motivated. So I don't tend to do endurance events or endurance sport like, like I used to. Um, so everything now is more, you know, short term energy system. Um, but I swear, you know, I'm interested to see, you know, what the what the situation is and, and why it's the case and what I can, if there's anything that's going to increase my awareness of, you know, how to go about things moving forward. Um, well, let's have a look then. Yeah. So, so this is, yeah. How long it takes you to recover your heart rate. It's a 60% of the differences genetics. Um, now, obviously if you are fit and exercise regularly, that will improve your heart rate recovery more than anything. Um, but let's see if there's anything else it wants to recommend. Because, yeah, you've got quite a few genetic variants. You can see there, the red ones, um, that will tend to lower that. So, yeah, it's just, you know, ability to recover the heart rate, for the heart rate to come down. I guess it's something that you might not really notice if you have or not, unless you're monitoring it and you have someone else's, you know, input on it. So, obviously, exercise, which you do, as I said, that's the number one thing. The more you exercise, the more your body is able to recover uh, effectively. Aerobic exercise specifically is the next recommendation. Yeah, I mean, I have mean, loads of walking, loads of walking, yeah. so and backwards walking, and um, yeah, optimizing sleep. Yeah, this is one of those things. You know, a lot of people these days they have like the whoop and the aura ring and things, right? They're measuring, and they they uh, definitely notice the correlation between the better you sleep, the more your heart rate has recovered from exercise. And right, then back to yeah, so. That's something that you're already on top of, staying hydrated. Yeah, probably a lot of these are fairly obvious recommendations in the fitness category. As you've seen with some of the other reports, they can be other stuff you haven't thought of. Um, and then most of the rest of it is good. So uh, typical level of muscle mass, typical level of muscle recovery. Um, so it gives a few different readings for muscles. So strength, uh, endurance, and... That was interesting. Scroll up again a sec. There was a tendon injury was typical likelihood oh so it's not a excessive likelihood it's just a tip okay yeah gotcha gotcha yeah i know you've had other issues but the only one that's showing up as having a genetic basis is the yeah yeah and you said you know your all your kids had that tendency as well so yeah i guess that makes sense uh metabolic rate typical as well so you know you don't need particularly more or less calories than anyone else um actually less likely to have achilles tendon injury i don't know if that's true but that's good news um, I don't know if you've had Achilles issues. So I know we're probably getting close to time, Mike. One other one that I wanted to show you, which is a bit of a bonus one with the limitless package, is um, actually personality. And I, this one's interesting to me because I don't know a lot of your health issues, but I know your personality quite well because we've known each other, been friends for years. Um, <laughs> so the personality one is um, obviously a certain amount of your personality is your upbringing, right? And, and your, your your parents and stuff like that like copying them but a certain amount of it is genetics it's actually interesting how much is are you familiar with the uh the big five like the um psychology perspective on personality no, like, no um, fill me in okay so there's uh five scales there's extraversion 
Um, there is agreeableness, there's uh, conscientiousness, there's neuroticism, and then there's uh, one more, which we'll get to. So where you are on those scales will determine your personality. This is classic psychology. So this is like mainstream, normal psychology rather than anything esoteric. Yeah. Um, and for at least four out of five of those, like genetics plays a big part. It's like 50%. And I look through these, and generally I would say on average about four out of five is accurate, but I thought with you actually it might even be five out of five, like it was very accurate. And I actually see that as a good sign, Mike, because often, and I know this might sound like me defending genetic insights, but often where I see like the one or two out of five where it's inaccurate for people, I often think it's because they're kind of going against their own true nature. Okay. Um, whereas with you, I feel like everyone was accurate, and that's probably because you're not going against your true nature. You're just being yourself. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see. Let's see. So the first one, oh, yeah, and I sh actually, before I show you, I should just ask you what you think. Uh, well, that's probably too late now. Uh, so would you say you're an extrovert or an introvert? Oh, introvert, yeah. Get me on my own. In my own company. <laughs> in golf balls. And I'm happy as a pig of shit. <laughs> Um, so there you go, introvert. Um, very definite there. And again, about 50% of the difference is genetic. So it can always be overrided by you know nurture, but even when it is overrode by nurture in this case, I think someone who's trying to be an extrovert, who innately is an introvert, it's a struggle for them. Yeah, sure. So yeah, so that's good. Uh, next one we've got is neuroticism. So this is a, a tendency to focus are on negative emotions or be more sensitive or being more like bulletproof like i don't care nothing is you know gonna bother me kind of thing oh so well i would say i would you know if, more yeah if i look at like my mum for example she was classic worry anxiety da, 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 and i feel like i've had to battle against that even though yeah but then my stepdad he was very much the complete opposite of that one wonder why they ever even got together um and um, I think I've probably been somewhat nurtured a little bit by that. But I would say I'm still, yeah, probably more like my mum in that regard. So probably, yeah, a bit of a warrior and a bit of a, um, yeah, you know, I don't think I'd go out into the world thinking, oh, but at the same time, I've definitely challenged myself in, um, you know, in certain things. So, yeah, I would say, you know, relatively, I don't know if my girlfriend would agree with that, but... <laughs> <laughs> But I think on a on a deep level, if we if we were getting down to like you know some of the um, yeah some of the um, some of the things that I've done to help um, resolve those issues of sensitivity like hypnosis and neuro linguistic programming, and recently on the bio cybernaut training, I mean all of the things that come to the forefront of uh, well that came to the forefront of my mind, things that I would work on are all all trying to resolve issues of the past um, where I've maybe been sensitive to a, a situation when somebody else maybe couldn't care less, you know? So that yeah. would make sense to me. Yeah, for sure. And I have the same genetic variant and the same tendency as you, right? Like trying very hard to <laughs> make myself better and make myself more secure. Yeah. 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 And yeah. setting up the world, setting up the world so that the security is automatic and you don't need the, to, to worry so much, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, you're absolutely right. You have a genetic tendency, as you said, probably inherited from your mother. This is 50 to 60% genetic. So it is just something that you inherit yeah. to a majority degree. And so, yeah, and the recommendations are exactly what you talked about, you know, mindfulness, exercise, therapy in terms of talking to various people. I don't, I don't know if you do traditional therapy, but, you know, I know you talk to practitioners and stuff. Oh, yeah, loads of different courses. And, and again, all designed to, I suppose, designed to help all of this. So. You know, that, yes. would, that would all make sense to me. Uh, so next one, agreeableness. So this is, is it important to you to be liked by people or is it more important to be honest and tell the truth? Is it more important to, you know, spare people's feelings or is it important to kind of get down to it? Um, yeah, it's interesting because I, I actually, when you scrolled for, when you scrolled down, I, I got a little snippet. You saw um, it, yeah. But so I, I can tell you now that sometimes I'm too honest. Um but at the same time, again, situation dependent, I definitely, you know, I'm happy if people like me. Sure. I think everyone does. It's more about do you prioritize it above all else? Like an agreeable person will. They will want to be liked and they will want to, uh, they will avoid confrontation. That would be another thing at all costs. Now, you're probably going to avoid confrontation because of the other things that we talked about to yeah. some degree. But I still feel like you're someone who speaks your mind. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 
And so, yeah, I mean, even your name, Aggressive Health, is a very disagreeable name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and being willing to challenge, being rebellious, all that, like, rather than fitting in, you know, oh, all God, of that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically, well, I mean, I do, you know, my whole life is, is, is just me doing what I want to do. <laughs> like every 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 part of it and uh i 100 percent agree and that actually leads on nicely to the next one but yeah just you know like it's it's they say competitive agreeable i say they you know this is put together by team of scientists i if it were up to me i'd probably rename this um and say it's you know more like are you more focused on telling the truth rather than having people like you that's the main thing that i see there yeah anyway. yeah yeah oh yeah i hate, I hate the not yeah the truth is the truth yeah that's the <laughs> so you know people who are more agreeable tend to be more passive aggressive you know that like if they're unhappy they won't tell you directly you know this this person will tell you directly yeah it's funny i listened to a thing with that Gabba Mate talking about people with uh, multiple sclerosis and you know and he was saying about people being people pleasers people pleasing mm. I was like oh man yep. that's definitely not I'm definitely not I'm definitely <laughs> not that <laughs> so that's agreeable when you're a people pleaser yeah, yeah. yeah all yeah. right let me make sure I don't scroll down and let you see the next result then so yeah conscientiousness so like an aspect of this is industriousness which is working hard but the real key distinction that I see there is are you focused on what you want to do or are you focused on like what you have to do? Well, it's weird that because I feel like I have to do the things I want to do because if I don't do those things, I'm not happy. So so I, I would actually put you around the middle of this. And, you know, it says 30, 60% is um, based on uh, genetic factors, but you are more on the carefree side. So what that, the, uh, when I saw this, I thought it was interesting because I know you are a hardworking guy, but I also know you absolutely cannot stand doing something that you don't want to do. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. And, and that you really want to do, you know, like, for instance, you, you know, as you said, you play golf every day and, um, you know, your leisure time is super important to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, you know, tends to go more of a carefree. So, again, I would say you express this well because you do – do as you just said a minute ago you spend all your time doing what you want to do uh but you've also learned to be you know responsible and, and hard working and stuff like yeah that. i think yeah no, yeah it's interesting again going back to all the things i've looked at and studied and, and read and wanting things i've wanted to achieve and you start to realize okay in order to do that i have to do this 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 and this i'm willing to do that i'm you know i've been, over the years i've been willing to to do what it takes to get where i want to go but at the same time i suppose i'm at my happiest like I look at that carefree and I think, right, I'm in Sardinia, I'm on the beach, I've got nut, I've got my drone tucked away in my bag. If I want, I can just fly the drone around or I can just relax, chill out. I mean, I love that. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, you and I have had that conversation back and forth for more than a decade, right? That I'll tell you about my big plans and then you'll tell me about your plans to be relaxing and enjoying yourself. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. I think I'm, I suppose, yeah, I suppose that care for, yeah, I, I look at that and I think, because people often say, oh, you know, that question of, oh, you know, how do you want to be remembered? I couldn't care less. I just want to be happy today. And if, if like, if I was going to die in two days time, but between now and then I can do a little bit of work, see, see the kids, see the family, play, play a bit of golf. I mean, it's just, I could rinse and repeat that for the next 20 30 years in fact half of what i do is to make sure i can still do that because i know that's what keeps me happy so so it's good and people like yourself you know they're a role model to others who are the other side to you know relax and enjoy life a bit more and you know vice versa um i know you've been that to me so oh yeah the last one so this made me laugh because i also think back to the amount of uh, conversations we we're, what we've had where you've been like oh i kind of would like to try this in theory but i would, would rather stick to what i know um and so open this to experience. Uh, this is about, and now this is the least influenced by genetics, but this is like, how open are you to trying something new? How open are you to looking at something new? Yeah, I don't think I'm, I, I, I mean, it's uh, to experience, when you say to experience, I, like I can think of many. It's, it's, it's really novelty, that's the key. Sorry, just to clarify yeah, what it means. I think um, there's been so many times when, say I've done something with, with Elizabeth and I'm like, oh wow, that was brilliant. Why haven't we done this before? And it's kind of like, well, could you never really show any interest to do anything like that? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, because because I, I never do. But then as soon as I, as soon as I do something, then I'm like, wow, this is brilliant. Whereas you know, I'm very much can't be bothered to begin with until we until we're in the middle of doing it. You know, 
yeah um, so, so yeah yeah cautious yeah definitely yeah i'm not really um yeah i would say yeah definitely definitely more cautious than open i'm definitely not oh yeah let's go travel around the world and try different things and da da da, da and see different places i mean I've got, part of me kind of thinks well that'd be nice but then i'm like well yeah but i'm, I'm too busy enjoying myself doing what i know that i like to yep. to, to to you know venture out and, and find what's new when um yeah so it's yeah it's interesting yeah definitely I think you're intellectually open and, you know, in some ways you are open, but as I said, I, you know, the bottom line is you want to do what you're familiar with and you want to have your daily routine and yeah. stuff like that. And that's, what's good for you. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so in terms of your feelings, the, you know, typical level of happiness, typical level of nervousness, I wouldn't describe you as a nervous person. So I would say that would be accurate as well. Um, I wouldn't describe you as very overflowing of joy or miserable. I'd say you're in the middle. Yeah. So that seems accurate to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. There was something else that stood out to me. Oh yeah. Here we go uh aggression normal yeah despite the name mike is not an aggressive guy i would say <laughs> <laughs> um risk taking is interesting um we we're just talking about an investment a couple of days ago that you made yeah i think yeah it's funny what i'm risk taking because like i yeah actually yeah yeah I, there's because the, going back to that thing earlier about being cautious mm -hmm. i can bounce between these two like i I cautiously went about doing a roulette strategy once, which some people are like, well, that's massive risk, Mike, because that's gambling. <laughs> but I was cautious in working out all the da 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 And I did win some money, but then as soon as I lost, I realized, actually, do you know what? Looking at those percentages, the casino is going to win at the end of the day. And then boom, stopped. But I took mm. the risk because I thought, mm, no, I can, I can, I can, you know. And then obviously then on the, a more professional level, um, yeah, I've, t I've taken some risk with some investment before. One thing has been completely, you know, um, completely burned. But then I can think of other investments where it paid off really well. Right? Yeah, that worked really well. Starting a business in the first place. So I just want to explain this to people because it sounds like, you know, it's just a contradiction, people watching. The d thing to me is risk taking means that you're willing to do something that seems like a long shot at every now and then at some point. Whereas the openness to caution thing is more how you live your day to day life. So that's why I see it being accurate for Mike that he could be both, right? As you say, day yeah. to day, you're more cautious, but you are willing to take big risks, starting a new business, new investments, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I can um, think of a few instances where I took some big risks lately and some I'm hoping will pay off. And but you never know, that's the thing. But yeah, I'm willing to take it. That's the, yeah, for sure. <laughs> It's actually, I would say it's an ideal combination in a way, Mike. Like if you're willing to take risks, but you have a cautious approach to it, um, that often does lead to wealth. You know, it's what they call a calculated risk taking, right? Yeah, you're willing yeah. to take a leap, but you do it carefully. Um, and then this one as well, leadership. I think this is the last one, the personality one. I very rarely see this, Mike. This is like a uh, lesson. I don't know what it doesn't say here, but I think it's about 10% of people that have it based on my experience of going through people's reports. So... Um, it actually says you have strong leadership qualities. Um, so what this means to me is that you're really able to inspire people. People admire you. People look up to you. People will f basically follow your lead, you know, as the word leadership implies. Um, I think my opinion is the only reason you're not in a more everyday leadership position is because of some of the other stuff we talked about, like you're introverted, you know, you prefer to be part of a routine. But it says that you have the ability to inspire people and I would say the fact that, uh, you know, you have the big following that I know you do, despite not really actually caring very much if you have a following. <laughs> um, yeah, I wouldn't say I've got a, I wouldn't say I've got a big following in, to, in today's, in today's, um, you know, kind of. Well, compared to the average man, you do. You know? oh, okay, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But yeah, I can, I can, but from that point of view, you say then about inspiring. I mean, I, I would like to think that in, in future years, um, that, I could certainly offer a lot of different, I think because I'm curious, at, oh, I don't know, let's take golf, for example, I've had different injuries. I've found different things that can help resolve those. I've found different methods to move forward and not be, you know, not hit a brick wall, brick wall. I'm very curious. I feel like that could definitely be inspiring to people. I've had recent conversations with people saying, well, look, you know, you don't have to give up here. There's this, it can be done. That can be done. This can be done. That can be done. There's this, you know, breakthrough and I, and I suspect talking to people about those kinds of things that could that could be somewhat inspiring and I do see I do think that you know as time goes on I mean you know nearly 50 being 60 years old is only like 12 years away I, I suspect that 
there'll be some degree of inspiration going on there when you know um other people of a similar age will be like well how do you do what you do um i mean it's not but then again <laughs> sometimes the answer to that question might be well watch this video because i feel like i know myself relatively well a lot of what you've said here kind of backs that up and maybe i've been lucky enough to follow and again from another thing that we did together i know that i've got good instinct and so i think a lot of my i think if if because again i don't know what it's like to be anybody else but if somebody had all these traits and not good instinct they might not be aware of any of this and yet this will help them find that but for me i feel like along the way my instincts have have, have allowed me to um um yeah create a life which is in alignment with my not i wouldn't say my strengths but you know my my predispositions yeah so yeah so that would be an answer to a question but if someone say well how do you do this when you're 60 years old well i've always been been guided by how do i feel as good as i can as much as i can and by constantly asking that question i've come up with my own answers and then been helped along by people like yourself and other practitioners who um have given me insight and then allowed me to go, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And then, you know, you sort of build your path in, in that regard. But yeah, so it's, yeah, it's interesting. That's great. Yeah, I think what you said about instinct is actually another key aspect of leadership, right? The fact that you are connected to your instincts, that you trust your instincts, that your instincts are reliable. And I think, yeah, that is a key part of why, you know, you're successful, absolutely. Um, so, well, we are, we're at an hour, I think we could, wrap it up mike i've known elwin for many years um and uh i know recently that he's spent a huge amount of time and money in getting this system in place and so yeah so it's 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 great to be able to offer it on the aggressive health site and if if anybody is interested in knowing themselves better and being able to target their nutritional needs as well as their, their other needs uh physical emotional and I suppose even spiritual to a degree, um, yeah. By by getting by you know by diving into this kind of technology and learning more about yourself, you just puts you in a greater position of power, I guess. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in any of these or all of these, then um, yeah, then head to um, the Aggressive Health Shop, and you should find it in the section under hardware. And uh, yeah, I hope you get as much benefit from it as I have, you know, going through this. And again, I've not even dived into everything yet, but I think this is a good, a good, a good picture. And and I think as well because you offer consultations, don't you, Owen? So people can, um, you know, if yeah, if they did want to dive deeper, then then they can do so. Yeah, just to explain, I mean, the system is set up that it's perfectly, you know, uh, set up that a person can go for it themselves if they want. But especially when people get the limitless package, which has you know over three hundred reports, it is a lot of information. If you really you know love to dive in, then great. But if you want someone to help you, you know, create it, if you want a bit of a guide, a walkthrough, then I do offer consultations to people once they've uh, uh, invested in Genetic Insights. Um, just to explain as well so what we showed you here is the limitless package where someone has access to everything but it can be overwhelming to some people so for instance some people are just interested in nutrition right they just want to know like what nutrients they need more of what nutrients they don't need more of and so like a package for that is significantly less expensive um i would say none of it's expensive but it's 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 a lot cheaper um and so uh you can either invest in the limitless or you can just invest in one of the packages that is a topic that's sort of interest to you in terms of the genetics um, you can either get a dna kit from us or if you ever have used any kind of ancestry service then you can use the raw dna data from there currently at the time of filming this 23 me are blocking people from downloading their raw data it's the first time it's happened in over 10 years so uh that I wouldn't recommend 23andMe currently for that reason, but still any other ancestry service, as far as I know, um, they will give you that access. Uh, the simplest way would be to get a DNA kit with us if you haven't already used a, another service. Great. Great, thank you, Mike. All right, thanks a lot, Elwin, and uh, yeah, we'll look forward to speaking to you again soon.